Hello, this is Beata from BA English Coaching and today I am joined by two beautiful girls. Ellie and Ella. And they have kindly agreed to read this book with me. So we are reading In the Sea There Are Crocodiles by Fabio Guetta and we are on chapter four, which is set in Turkey. And the girls, they both read the book at their secondary school they, but they have kindly agreed to read it again with me and to support this challenge and um, the charity that I am doing it for as well. Did you like the book when you read it at school, Ellie? Yeah. And what did you like about the book? It was like really interesting to learn about different people's like, lifestyles and how it differentiates to ours. Okay, good. Thank you. And Ella, did you enjoy reading the book at school? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a bit more? Um, it made me realise that how people are so much more less fortunate than I am and mm. that I'm lucky to be mm -hmm. in the place I am now. So it's not only for non-native speakers, but also, you know, English uh, children and English teenagers can read this book at school. As we have already said and um, experienced, it is an amazing book. It's moving. It's inspirational. There are bits which are really sad, but that's what Ella said. It only makes us realize that how fortunate we are. As with previous chapters, I would like you to copy after the girls. Their English is beautiful, very clear. So copy their expression, pronunciation, rhythm, intonation. We encourage fluent reading, but I do have a couple of questions that I will ask at the end of this session. So I think we are ready and we can start reading. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. So chapter four, Turkey. Now let's see where I was in time and in my story. I'd reached a point of no return, as you say here, because we don't say it. At least I never heard anyone say it. I was at such point of no return that I'd even stopped remembering things. And there were whole days and weeks when I didn't think at all about my little village in Ghazni province and my mother or my brother or my sister the way I did at the start when their image was like a tattoo on my eyes day and night since the day I'd left about four and a half years had passed a year and a few months in Pakistan and three years in Iran you have to you have to weigh things properly as a lady says who sells onions in the market near where I'm living now I was about 14 when I decided to leave Iran I'd had my full of that life Sophie and I had gone back to Qom. After that, second repatriation. But he had left a few days later because, in his opinion, it had become too dangerous. He'd found work in Tehran or on a building site. Not me. I had decided to stay and work a while longer in the same stone-cutting factory to work hard and not spend any money so that I could put enough aside to pay for the journey to Turkey. But how much did it cost to leave for Turkey? or rather to arrive, which was the most important thing. Anyone can leave. How much would I need to spend? Sometimes, if you want to find something out, all you have to do is ask. So I asked a few friends I trusted. 700,000 Taman. 700,000 Taman. Yes, and I act. That's 10 months work, I said to a boy called Wahid, who had once thought of leaving and then hadn't. My salary at the factory is 70,000 Taman a month, I said. So that'll be 10 months without spending even small change. He nodded, fishing with his spoon in the chickpea soup and blowing it, blowing on it in order to not burn his tongue. I also dipped my spoon in the soup. Tiny black seeds were floating forlornly on the greasy surface along the crumbs of bread. First I moved them with the tip of the spoon, creating eddies and currents, then gathered them together, swallowed them and finished off the soup by drinking it straight from the cup. How to find all that money? One afternoon, a Friday, which, as I already said, was our time to do what we wanted and which I spent in an endless indeterminate, is that the right word? Football tournament against teams from the neighbouring factories. Anyway, one Friday, this friend of mine, I talked to at dinner, about traffickers came up to the stone where I was lying, which one hand on my stomach trying to get my breath back and asked me to listen to him for a second. I sat up. He wasn't alone. There were other Afghans with him. Listen, Anayat, he said. We've talked. We want to leave for Turkey and we've put aside enough money 
to pay for the journey and to pay for you too, if you want. And we are not only doing it because you are our brother and all that, but also because when you live with friends, the chances of everything going right are better than when you live on your own without anyone to help you in, in an emergency. At that point, the team, which had gone out on the field after us scored, and everyone yelled for joy. What do you say? He asked after a pause. What do I say? Yes. I say thank you and I accept. What else can I say? It's a dangerous journey, you know? I know. Much more dangerous than the other journeys. The ball bounced off the stone and stopped between my feet. I kicked it back with the tip of my shoe. The sun had seized every corner of the sky. The blue wasn't blue, but yellow. The clouds were golden and bleeding where the mountains cut into them. The rocky peaks where stone can crush and snow can wound and suffocate. I didn't know that mountains can kill. I pulled up a blade of dry grass and started to suck on it. I've never seen the sea, I said. There are a whole lot of things I haven't seen yet in my life and that I'd like to see. Plus, even here in Com, it's dangerous every time I set foot outside the factory. So you know what I say. I'm ready for anything. My voice was firm, but only because of my ignorance. If I'd, if I'd known what was in store for me, I wouldn't have left. Or maybe I would. I don't know. I certainly would have said it differently. We'd all done it. We'd all listened to the stories of those who had gone and come back. And we knew about those who had, hadn't made it from the accounts of their travelling companions. Maybe those companions had survived only to share their horror stories with us. It was as if the government left one or two people alive in every group to scare the others. Some had frozen to death in the mountains. Some had been killed by the border police. Some had drowned in the sea between the Turkish and Greek coasts. One day, during the lunch break, I talked to a boy who had a disfigured face. Half of it looked like a McDonald's hamburger that's been left too long on the griddle. McDonald's? Yes, McDonald's. It's funny. Sometimes you say things like, he was as tall as a goat. At other times, when you make comparisons, you come up with McDonald's or baseball. Why is that funny? Because they belong to different cultures, different worlds, at least. That's how it seems to me. Even if that was true, Fabio, both those worlds are inside me now. He told me that the transit van on which he'd been travelling across Cappadocia had been involved in an accident. At a bend on an unpaved mountain road in Aksare province, it had collided with a van loaded with lemons. He'd been thrown out and had scraped his face on the ground. Then the Turkish police had arrested him and beaten him up. And then they handed him over to the Iranians and they'd beaten him up too. So his journey to Europe, he wanted to go to Sweden, had turned into a bloody mess, along with his dreams. I'd lend you the money to leave, he said, but I can't because I don't want to be responsible for your pain. And there were others who said the same as him, but I'm not sure they were genuine. They might just have been skinflints. And yet, all I needed was one story that ended well. All I needed to hear was, he made it. He got to Turkey or Greece or London, and I immediately felt encouraged. If he had made it, I thought, then so could I. In the end, there were four of us who'd made up our minds to leave. Then we found out that Fareed, a boy who was working in the factory around the corner from ours, was also planning to leave Com. But that wasn't all. The trafficker he was going to use was his cousin. This sounded like an opportunity not to be missed. If the trafficker really was his cousin, we could trust him. And if he left us, we would become friends of the cousin and be treated accordingly. One day, a day like no other, we finished our shift, put our things in canvas rucksacks, said goodbye to the manager of the factory, asked for the wages due to us, risking the usual roadblocks, took a scheduled bus to Tehran. At the, at the station, we found our friend's cousin waiting for us. He took us to his house in a taxi, one of those collective taxis with a lot of people inside. In the dining room, over a cup of chai, he told us, we had two days to get some food for the journey. Simple but nutritious food, like dried fruit, almonds, pistachios, and buy a pair of head heavy mountain shoes and warm waterproof clothes. They have to be waterproof, he said. And also nice clothes to wear in Istanbul. We certainly couldn't walk 
around the city wearing the same clothes we'd been wearing during the journey, which would have been torn and smelly by then. We had to buy all that, but especially the shoes. Our friend's cousin was really insistent about that. So we went round the bazaars doing our shop, shopping, and there was a euphoria in the air that I can't describe. When we got back, we showed the shoes to the trafficker to know if they were all right. He lifted them, checked the seams, bent the soles, looked inside of them and everything, and said, yes, they were fine. It wasn't true. He said in good faith. I'm certain of that because his cousin, and the reason he said it, it in good faith was because he thought he knew what our trek across the mountains would be like. But he didn't know at all, because he'd never been there. He just had to hand over us to others. He was a go-between. He was the person we had to phone once we got to Turkey and say, we've arrived, so that the friends in com we left, behind, we left the money with could hand it over to him. Holding the shoes up to the light coming in through the window, he said, Your journey will last three days. These are solid shoes, just what you need. You've done well. Excellent purchase. The following morning, an Iranian picked us up in a taxi and took us to a house outside the city where we waited. After an hour, a bus arrived. The driver was an accomplice and the passengers had no idea what was going on. The driver tooted his horn and we ran out of the house and climbed on the bus. The passengers, mostly women and children, but also men, looked on in astonishment. The men tried to protest, but were immediately silenced. We set off for Tabriz. I know, because I asked. We were on our way to the border, and once past Tabriz, we drove along the shores of Lake Omiya, which, for those who don't know, is in the middle of Iranian Azerbaijan, just to give you the same idea, and is the largest lake in the country. At its fullest, about 140 kilometres long and 55 wide. I'd almost doze off when one of my travelling companions nudged me with his elbow and said, Look! What? I said without opening my eyes. The lake. Look at the lake. I turned my head and slowly opened one eyelid with my hands between my legs. I looked out of the window. It was sunset and the sun was low over the water. We could see dozens and dozens of rocky little islands against the light and all over the islands, both on the ground and in the air. Dots. Thousands of dots. What are they? Birds. Birds? My grating birds. The man sitting in front told me. Is it true they are birds? Aha Sahib. I asked the man, tapping him on the shoulder. Flamingos, pelicans and lots of other species. The man said. Hulagu Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan and conqueror of Baghdad, is buried on one of those islands. So there are birds and ghosts. That may be why there are no fish in the lake. No fish? Not a single one. Bad waters. Only good for rheumatism. It was dark by the time we got to Salmas, the last city in Iran and the closest to the mountains. They made us get out, told us to stay close together and keep quiet. And we started walking without torches or anything. Early in the morning, in the silence and the pale light of dawn, we came to a little village. There was a little house that went into as if it belonged to us, though it didn't. It belonged to a family. It was a kind of collection paint for Ill illegals who wanted to cross the mountains. A small group was already there and soon afterwards more arrived, Afghans. In the end, there were 30 of us. We were scared. We wondered how so many of us would be able to cross the mountains without being seen. We asked, but didn't get an answer. And when we insisted, they made it clear it was best to stop right there with our questions. We stayed in that house for two days, waiting. Then at sunset, on the evening of the second day, they told us to get ready. We set off under a starry sky and a big moon, so we didn't need lights or torches or eyes or like an owls. We could see very well. We walked for half an hour between the fields, along little paths invisible to those who didn't know them. As we reached the top of the first slope, a group of people emerged from behind a big rock. We took fright and some yelled that they were soldiers, but they weren't. There were 30 more illegals. We couldn't believe our eyes. Now there were 60 of us, 60 in a line on the mountain paths, but it wasn't over. Half an hour later, another group appeared. They had been squatting on the ground, waiting for our arrival. By the time we were finally able to make a head count, during a brief stop in the middle of the night, there were 77 of us. 
They split us into ethnic groups, apart from Afghans, who were the youngest. There were Kurds, Pakistanis, Iraqis, and a few Bengalis. They split us up to avoid problems. In so, in so far as that was possible, given that we were walking all day shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, with different strides, but at the same speed. And when you're in a situation like that, making a lot of effort in uncomfortable circumstances, with not much food and not much water and nowhere to rest, and it's very, very cold. Then squabbles and brawls and even knife fights are always on the cards, so it's best to keep the hostile ethnic groups apart. After an hour spent walking along a very rough dirt path, we were stopped halfway up a hill by a shepherd accompanied by a dog, madly chasing his own tail. The dog, not the shepherd. <laughs> he asked to speak to the leader of the expedition, who, without a second thought, took some money from his jacket and paid him to stop giving us away to the police. The shepherd counted the money slowly, very slowly, then put it inside his hat and signalled to us to continue. As I passed him, the old man looked at me, straight in the eyes, as if to tell me something. But I didn't know what. By night we walked, by day we slept, or tried to. At the end of the third day, because the trafficker back in Tehran, our cousin's friend, had told us the journey would last three days and three nights, we wanted to know how much longer it would be before we got to the top of the mountain. To us, it still seemed to be far as ever and started descending towards Turkey. But we were all too scared to ask questions, so we drew lots. And I was one picked out. I approached one of the smugglers and he said, Aka, please, how long is it before we get to the top of the mountain? Without looking at me, he replied, A few hours. I went back to my friend and said, A few hours. We walked until before dawn and stopped. The muscles in our legs were hard as concrete. At sunset, as usual, we set up again. He lied to you, said Farid. I already realised that. I said thanks. But your cousin wasn't very accurate either when he told us how long it would take. You have to ask someone else. After an hour, I approached another one of the Iranians, who had a Kalashnikov across his shoulder. Agha, please, I said, falling into step beside him. How long till we get to the top of the mountain? Not long, he replied without looking at me. What does not long mean, Agha? Before dawn. I went back to my friends and said, it won't be long. If we keep up a good pace, we'll be there before dawn. They all smiled, but nobody said anything. Any strength we might have had to speak had drained out of us, through our feet and our noses, and hung in the clouds of steam and materialised in the front of our lips. We trudged on until the sun came up over the, the direction of Nava, my home. The top of the mountain was there. One step away, so we, so close we could reach it in with in one bound. We circled it. We didn't move. We rested. When the rays of the sun lit up, its jagged ridges, ridges, which looked like a dead man's spine, the whole group stopped. We all looked for a rock to put our heads under, or to keep in the shade and sleep for a few hours. Our legs and feet were left in the sun to warm and dry them. It was so hot it tore our skin off. But what the hell? At sunset, they made us get up and we were set off again. It was the fifth night. Aka, please, how long is it before we get to the top of the mountain? A couple of hours. He replied, not looking at me. I joined the group. What did he say? Nothing. Shut up and walk. We Afghans were the youngest, the most used to stones and heights, the blazing sun, the freezing snow. But this mountain was endless, a maze. The peak was always there, but we never seemed to reach it. Ten days and ten nights dripped away, one after the other, like water dripping from a stalactite, stalactite. Early one morning, it was dark, and we were clambering over the rocks on our hands and knees. A Bengali boy got into difficulty. I don't know what it was, maybe a breathing problem, or maybe his heart, but he fell and slid down over the snow for several metres. We started yelling. Wait, someone's dying here. We have to stop and help him. But the traffickers, there were five of them, fired in the air with their Kalashnikovs. Anyone who doesn't start walking again immediately stays here forever, they said. We tried to help the young Bengali to take him by the arms and under the armpits to help him up and get him to walk. But it was too much for us. He was too heavy. We were too tired, too everything. It wasn't possible. We abandoned him as we rounded a bend. I could still hear his voice for a moment. Then it faded, completely, swallowed by the wind.
On the 15th day, there was a knife fight between a Kurd and a Pakistani. I don't know what they were fighting over, food maybe, or maybe nothing at all. The Kurd ended up the loser, we abandoned him too. On the 16th day, for the first time, I talked to a Pakistani boy who wasn't much older than I. Afghans and Pakistanis don't usually talk much to each other. As we walked, we were in one of those areas where the wind wasn't too bad and we were able to speak. I asked him where he was heading, what he planned to do and where he planned to go after we got to Istanbul. He didn't reply immediately. He seemed lost in thought. He looked at me if, as if he wasn't sure he understood the question. With the kind of expression on his face, that seemed to, that seemed to say, what an idiot. London, he said, walking faster to get away from me. Later, I discovered that all the Pakistanis were the same. They never said Turkey or Europe. They just said London. If any of them was in a good mood and asked me, how about you? I would say somewhere. On the 18th day, I saw a group of people sitting on the ground. I saw them in the distance and couldn't figure out at first why they'd stopped. The wind was like a razor and my nose was clogged with snow. But when I tried to wipe it away with my fingers, it was no longer there. All at once, we turned a sharp bend and there they were, the group of people sitting on the ground. They'd be sitting there forever. They were frozen. They were dead. I have no idea how long they'd been there. All the others siddled silently past them. I stole the shoes from one of them because mine were ruined and my toes had turned purple. I couldn't feel them anymore, even if I hit them with a stone. I took the shoes and tried them on. They fitted me well. They were much better than mine. I raised my hand in a gesture of gratitude. I think about him every now and then. Every day, twice a day, they gave us an egg, a tomato and a piece of bread. New supplies arrived on a horse. But now we were too high for that. On the 22nd day, they handed out the last rations. They told us to divide them into the pieces to make them last. But an egg, a boiled egg, is a hard thing to divide. The others summoned up the courage to push me forward. Ask, they said. What's the point, I replied. Never mind, just ask. As, are we nearly there? I asked one of the traffickers. Yes, he said. We are nearly there. But I didn't believe him. And yet on the 26th day, the mountain came to an end. One step, another, then another, and all of a sudden we stopped climbing. There was nothing more to climb. We'd reached the top. This was where the Iranians handed us over to the Turks. At the point for the first time since the beginning of our trek, we did another head count. Twelve people were missing. Of the group of 77 had died during the walk. Most Bengalis and Pakistanis vanished into silence. And I hadn't even noticed. We looked at each other as if we'd never seen each other before. As if it hadn't been us walking. Our faces were red and in ruins. The lines were cut. The cracks bled. The Turks who were waiting for us made us sit down on the ground in concentric circles to protect ourselves from the cold. Every half hour, we had to change places. Those in the middle had to move to the outside so that everyone could take turns getting warm and feeling the cold wind on the worlds of their backs. On the 27th day, I know it was the 27th day because I carry each and every one of those days round my neck like the beads of a necklace. We came down off the mountain and the mountain slowly turned into hills and woods and meadows and streams and fields and all the wonderful things there are on the earth. In the spots where there weren't any trees, they made us run in groups, keeping our heads down. Sometimes they open fire, they said. Who? It doesn't matter who. Sometimes they open fire. After two days, two more days, two days that could have been two years or two centuries, we reached the van. Van is also on a lake, Lake Van. Our journey had been a journey from one lake to another. On the outskirts of this Turkish town, the first Turkish town we stopped in, we sneaked into a field and spent the night sleeping in the tall grass. Some Turkish peasants, friends of the traffickers, were nice to us and brought us something to eat and drink. I would have liked to change my clothes. The one I was wearing were dirty and torn, like rags to clean floor with. But the nice clothes I'd brought in Tehran I had to keep for Istanbul. I couldn't run the risk of getting them dirty and smelly before time. I really couldn't. Before dawn, they had us jumping out of the grass like crickets, loaded us in a lorry and drove us to another place nearby. It was kind of a huge cow shed with a very high ceiling, a cow shed for the illegals instead of cows. And they made the Afghans sleep next to the Pakistanis, which is never a good idea. That night, there was a quarrel over space and a fight broke out. 
The Turks were forced to intervene and separate us. They didn't discriminate. They hit everyone. We were stuck in that cow shed for four days. One night, while we were sleeping, the roar of an engine started the walls shaking. The Turks told us to gather our things together and hurry. They rounded us up against the wall by ethnic group and started letting us out a few at a time. I assumed to stop those inside from seeing what was happening outside and where they were putting us. We stood in a corner for about 10 minutes, clutching our rucksacks to our chests. Then someone called us and we went out. The first thing was the vehicle with the noisy engine had its lights on and they were aimed straight at the door. So I was blinded. The second thing was the vehicle was with the noisy engine turned out to be a lorry, a huge lorry with a huge trailer, which seemed to be full of stones and gravel. Come around this end, they said. We walked around to the back of the trailer. Get in, they said. Where? All we could see was gravel and stones and dust in the beams of light. The trafficker pointed downwards. I thought he meant we should get underneath the lorry, but then I took a closer look, which should have made me believe what I was seeing, but I didn't want to believe it. And I realised that between the bed of the trailer, which carried, off, which carried the gravel and stones, and the underside of the lorry, where the axle shaft was to make things clearer, there was a small space, maybe 50 centimetres high, or slightly more. In other words, the lorry had a false bottom, a 50 centimetre high space, in which to sit with our arms clasped around our legs and our knees against our chests and our necks bent to keep our heads wedged between our knees. They gave us each, they gave each of us two bottles, one full and one empty. The full one was for water, the empty one was to pee into. They filled the false bottom with us, all of us, the 50 or however many of us there were. We weren't just cramped, we were very cramped, more than cramped. We were like grains of rice, squeezed into someone's hand. When they closed the hatch, the darkness had liberated us. I felt suffocated. Let's hope it's a short journey, I thought. Let's hope it doesn't last long. A voice was moaning somewhere. I could feel the weight of the stones on the back of my neck, the weight of the air and the night of the, on the stones, the weight of the sky and the stars. I started to breathe. I started breathing through my nose, but I was breathing dust. I started breathing with my mouth, but my chest hurt. I would have liked to breathe with my ears or my hair, like plants, which gather humidity in the air from the air. But I wasn't a plant, and there was no oxygen. We were start. We were stopping. I thought at one point, but it was just a traffic junction. On the other, on another occasion, I thought, we're there now. We're there. But it was the driver who got out to have a pee. I heard him. Nothing escapes me. Oh no. By the time I next said to myself. We've arrived. My knees and shoulders were dead, but it was a false alarm. I don't know why we stopped that time. After a while, I stopped existing. I stopped counting the seconds or imagining our arrival. My thoughts and my muscles were weeping. My fatigue and my bones were weeping. Smells. I remember the smells. Pee and sweat. Screams from time to time and voices in the dark. I don't know how much time had passed when I heard someone moaning horribly, as if they were having their nails pulled out. I thought it was a dream at first. I thought the hoarse voice mixed with the noise of the engine wasn't real. Water, he was saying. That one word. Water. But he was saying it in a way I can't describe. I knew who it was. I'd recognised him. I also started to cry out. Water. Just to do something to say. Help. There's someone dying. But nobody responded. Drink your own pee, I said. Because he wouldn't stop crying. But I don't know if he heard. He didn't reply. Just kept on moaning. It was unbearable. So I started crawling on my belly, through the mass of bodies, which people punching and pinching me as I passed, which is understandable, because I was squashing them. I reached the boy, I couldn't see him, but with my hands I groped for his face, his nose, his mouth. He was moaning, repeating, water, water, water. I asked someone nearby if they still had any left in their bottle, because mine was finished, but everyone had drunk every drop. I slid over the bodies again until I found a Bengali boy who said yes. He still had some water at the bottom of his bottle, but no, he wouldn't give it to me. I said, I beg you. He said no. I implored him. Just to sit. He said no, and as he was saying no, I was trying to figure out where his no was coming from. I threw a punch at the no. I felt his teeth against my fist, and when he cried out, I slapped him over and over, not to hurt him, just to find the bottle. As, as soon as I felt it, I grabbed hold of it in my hand and disappeared, which was the easiest thing in the world to do in that place. I took, I took the boy to the remaining water, which made me feel good, if only for a short time. It made me feel human. It lasted three days. We never got out. 
The door was never opened, then a light, an electric light. Thank you so much for reading, girls. And uh, yes, yeah, so we will finish here now, but for your homework, can you please finish reading chapter four? As you can see that it's getting really emotional and, you know, we will finish with this pas passage where I think I can only say one thing. I hope you will find more than just the language. You will find its um, wider meaning in this book. And as I said at the beginning, I would like to give you um, some homework, something to think about, because the whole thing is, yes, we are trying to improve our language skills. We are trying to improve our English pronunciation, expression, you know, rhythm, speed. But um, there is something else. There is something deeper that we can find and we can take from, from this book. So um, if you find the time, could you please choose a particular situation from chapter four, maybe the one in the mountains, maybe the one in, in the van. And if you were a Nayat, what would you do in such a situation? What decisions would you make or what actions would you take and why? So can you please think about these answers? And uh, yes, you can also practice second conditional and you can share your thoughts and comments uh, in the comments below. So thank you for uh, watching. Thank you again, girls, for sharing your time and skills and gifts uh, with us. And if you have enjoyed this, please subscribe to my channel and we look forward to reading chapter four, Greece, with you soon. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>